Stephen Bruce, welcome. Uh, we're so happy to have you with us uh, at the North Berkeley Wealth Management Art Gallery um, to have your beautiful work uh, to be shared with our community. And uh, looking forward to talking with you today about your background, your life as an artist and your work. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm excited. As so many people say, uh, let's begin at the beginning. And um, I actually wanted to pull something out that I heard you mention about your childhood, which was that you would make bracelets as a child out of copper mm -hmm. and watched them turn green because of the interaction with um, your skin. And I'm curious, can you talk about that first early um, interaction with copper and what kind of connection it has to the work you do today? You know, um, I think back on it and, um, you know, you know, as a young as a young person, you like something shiny and bling in, and that's what I envisioned the bracelets. Being. Um, I had no idea that they would turn green, um, and um, and so it was, it was a really big disappointment for me. Um, not only did it make them less marketable in my eyes, in my young entrepreneurial eyes, <laughs> um, um, it just wasn't the shiny thing I envisioned, and so. Um, it just, it was just a way for me to uh, um, capitalize on, you know, taking the copper that I collected instead of recycling it and making it in, in bracelets and selling them uh, for more than the 50 cents a pound that I got from the recycler. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> but in my disappointment, you know, when I complained to my father, my father explained to me why, you know, why, you know, why this happens. And he talked about the interaction of oxidation and acid in the environment. And in particular, the acid in our skin, um, you know, the oils in our skin have acid and, and will actually interact with the metal. And so you hear a lot of they, um, they don't like wearing copper, you know, because it, it turns their skin green. Right. <coughs> and I tell them, well, it's not, your, your skin's not turning green because of the copper. The copper's turning green because of your skin. <laughs> and, and then, you know, and depositing a little bit of the patina uh, you know, back onto your skin. Um, when you look up the, uh, the definition of patina, it'll say the superficial uh, color of, of, of metal, you know, as it changes. Um, actually, it does say it's a structural because the steel steel actually does break down, but copper, it really is a superficial patina. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but as, a, as an adult, I just thought about that lecture because um, my father had used you know, a penny, which kind of turns brown, and a Statue of Liberty, which is green, and any copper pipe, which is blue. And so that was enough variation in color to, to set my mind, you know, uh, off on a curious journey. And, um, and so I just kind of revisited that, you know, that uh, experience with my father as an adult and wondered if I could actually find other uh, oxidation responses, uh, you know, other color responses. And, and I had no idea, you know, that it would take me on the journey that it has. Can you can you like talk a little bit about the other um, avenue in uh, to art for you and uh, the business that you originally had um, many years ago? Well, I, I you know as I start I started uh, started a business with my with, with my then wife so she could stay home with the kids, and it was called Heritage Expressions um, African American Art Literature and Greeting Cards, and it really was to fill a niche. At the time, which was to provide uh, you know Af African American imagery um, in the area of you know of greeting notes and 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 children's books in particular um, and art, uh, since those all those niches have been filled quite adequately since <laughs> since, since those days. Um, but one of the first things I learned was that the uh, artwork that was on the business cards or that was uh, in a book. Um, you know, were just uh, reproductions of artists' work that they had maybe licensed for that purpose. Um, and as I, did, as, I, as I met those artists and developed relationships with those artists, I just found that selling artwork was, um, um, well, A, was more profitable and, and more interesting. Uh, the great things about neat greeting cards and books are, is there's always, um, at the time, I always felt parents will always spend money for a book for their child. So there's a kind of a need, a greeting card. There's always going to be a need for a greeting card. Art is 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 a, more of an emotional pur uh, purchase. Uh, that being said, it's also you know 
uh, typically a higher margin. Um, and, and so that's where I, that's where I, you know, rested my energy. And it just so happened, I, you know, was working with a couple of, you know, phenomenal artists originally and um, where I was able to learn uh, more about the art industry uh, and about the create and about the and about creativity. I remember you saying, you know, art is not about the execution. It's about the creativity. It's about what you bring to it. Um, and, you know, you have this interesting confluence of uh, coming from a tradition of black art, working with artists, black artists in the community. And fast forward in time, I'm kind of jumping over your own current work here, but fast forward in time, your work with the um, Art of the African Diaspora at the Richmond Art Center and your work with Red Umbrella. And I'm wondering, could you tell us a little bit about the current uh, art scene for African-Americans? Well, you know, it's, really, um, it's really interesting. I, I attended an artist talk this weekend and, um, and it, was, it, was, uh, it was put on by the Art of the African Diaspora. And it was, uh, ooh, I know that the theme was about, all about the amazing murals that have popped up mm-hmm. um, in the pandemic. And of course, there's some, you know, some really strong, engaging conversation. Uh, one of the things that I think that African-American artists deal with is this, am I an artist? Am I African-American artist who creates work or am I, am I an artist who creates African-American art? And, and, mm-hmm. and both can be true and none of them have to differentiate you know, uh, you know, you from just, just being an artist in general. I usually tell artists, um, nothing can change you from being African-American. <laughs> and, and nobody walks into the Barnes Foundation and sees pictures of you know, Europeans and says, oh, look at this beautiful white art. It's just art. And so um, as an African-American, you bring a unique uh, perspective to creativity uh, based on your experiences. Um, and your background and your culture. Um, and so I try to focus on, let's just talk about art. And everybody can recognize when I walk in the room um, that I'm African-American. Now, you don't may not see that by my artwork. I know when I first started, I thought it was very important to um, portray some sense of, you know, uh, Afro centricity in my work, and um, but I found that as I you know as I moved away, as I kept moving, as I kept growing as an artist, that it was just more important for me to show my creativity, and that I think it's just important for African American artists to demonstrate you know, that we aren't limited to African American art isn't limited to subject of Black people or African people. Um, it's, you know, our creativity, you know, expands, you know, as widely as anybody else's. And so um, it's probably a conversation that will go on forever with African-American artists. Um, and, um, but I choose, you know, when I'm, when I'm coaching artists and talking to young know, artists, just focus on your creativity. Because at the, at the heart, uh, art is about communication and it's about an experience and, and everybody we talk to, you know, is going to be human and may share our experience at some level. And when we make those connections, that's what really makes the art. Can you talk a little bit about your, your projects, bringing uh, chemistry and art together uh, in the schools? Um, it's, probably, it's probably the thing I'm most passionate about other than making art. Um, um, science, as a child, at some point kind of loses its fun when you get into the discipline of and I think because we don't, because we don't keep the creativity of science alive, you know, throughout the process, and um, mm-hmm. and so for me, uh, just having that conversation with a teacher in the East Bay, um, you know, years ago, uh, we said, well, how, you know, how, what can we do? You know, what 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 can help? You know, what can help kids? You know, plug in. And I thought that what I do would be really, you know, would be really fascinating to kids. Not that. Not that I'm more fascinating, but that, you know, the idea that you could create artwork, you know, with pickle juice or hot sauce or something like that would kids kind of giggle and, and then, you know, kind of uh, get excited about it. Um, and so we kind of put together, you know, uh, we did a uh, enrichment program where it was after school and it was 
every week for a month was initially the you know the the program but um as it grew and people asked you know people had requests to do it schools would have that kind of time frame and so uh, we kind of we just kind of changed it to a you know to a one week program or to a you know two day program but it allows kids to experience the creativity of art and um so one of the things I love to do when I walk into a classroom and I love to hold up one of my pieces of artwork and say, you know, who would give me, you know, hundred dollars for this? And, you know, of course, there's always one very, you know, flattering student that raises her hand <laughs> and says yes. But most, you know, kind of look and go, oh, you know, I would, you know, and I tell them immediately, I say, that's the beauty of being an artist, that I create artwork and people are willing to pay me thousands of dollars. And yet, only one person here is going to give me a, a you know, a hundred dollars. I said, but the, but the other part of that, about that, about that unique creativity is that you, you get to just find your people, you know, and you don't, and you align yourself with people who understand what you're doing. And so I think, I think using um, art um, as a, as a, as a, uh, as a doormat to, you know, introducing students to science. And then once they get there, explaining to them, how important the creativity is in that science. And then the third part is that we all have that uh, unique creativity that, you know, that, that, that's ours and only ours. And until we share it, um, you know, does it become, does anybody ever get a chance to even uh, enjoy it? And, um, and everybody won't enjoy it. Everybody doesn't like the Jackson 5, but, you know, enough people do. And, and that's all you need. I like what you say about, you know, that you'll find your people through it that's and they might be they could be anybody that's, that's uh i <laughs> i grew years ago at my sister's house i was doing something i, was, I got even like the show and she said well, you know how'd it go i said oh it was great i forgot what the audience was uh, but i had a really great experience and i said my people <laughs> <laughs> she goes what are you talking about i go they they got me you know they, they understood they understood me and, um, and, and she just and she just chuckled, and so but she knew what I meant because that was my mother's thing was find your people. So talk a little bit about your art, about what you the the work you're doing with the copper, how you think about it, what the experience is like for you of, of doing that. I spent years experimenting on different processes to create color on metal, and one of the techniques I use was this where I take salt water and I first treat the metal with a chemical and then I come back and I start washing it with salt water. And the, and I'm always, I'm always taking, you know, some, you know, maybe a household acid or something, you know, you know, as simple as salt um, or pickle juice or hot sauce. Um, and I use chemicals as well. And, and as I think of a piece, I'm thinking of what's going to give me, um, what's going to give me that sense of, of the vision that I have, you know, what, what chemical reaction will, will best suit that. And um, and then once you're into it, you have to figure out, OK, because it doesn't always, you know, I tell people when you see a painting of the Sierras, you know, we assume that because we recognize that it's the Sierras that the artist intended the exact vision that we are now seeing. And somewhere along that journey, there's an opportunity to do something maybe that enhances that vision or just changes that vision a little bit. Um, I find it more exciting when I actually have a little bit of spontaneity in that process. Uh, because that's just something else I could tuck into my toolkit later on for further, you know, use. So um, many of your pieces have a really brilliant uh, turquoise kind of range of colors. What chemical is it that uh, brings about that turquoise? So, uh, fundamentally, you know, there's some uh, so ammonia sulfate is, is a is a fertilizer. Uh, ammonia will give you blues uh, on color, okay. and depending so depending on what I mix that with, which I mean, you know, whether I get those more azure tones or not, uh, mm -hmm. to using uh, ammonia sulfate and muriatic acid, and the two together give you that, you know, that kind of uh, a turquoise color. Um, mm -hmm. There is another uh, uh, factory made chemical that gives you a kind of a version of that, but I usually have to add a little more ammonia to amp up the blues a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's, and it's I usually say it's probably the most popular work that I do. However, you know, it kind of goes on, I go on stretches where I can, like right now, I'm really excited. I've, you know, I've had about uh, nine landscapes 
have sold, you know, in the last four months. Mm-hmm. Bolstered my, <laughs> bolstered my. <laughs> well, you know, I love your landscapes. And what I love about them is the coming together of different, um, you know, of, a, of different phases. You've got the sky and the water or the land and the sky or the water and the uh, greenery and the sky, you know, combinations of things. Um, you know, are you, do you think of particular landscapes? Or are you thinking of moods or weather or how, 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 do you, how do you go about that? Probably all of the above. And so I say that, so um, I had a piece titled Church Rock and very few people know where Church Rock is unless you're from the region. It's in uh, New Mexico mm-hmm. and it runs somewhere north I think of Highway 40. Um, and, um, but it, as I was traveling cross country, um, you know, I just saw the, you know, the rock formation, the beautiful skies, and so there's something very uh, emotional to me about about that, uh, you know, about seeing the sky and the way it's moving and, and the sunset and the, and the, mm-hmm. you know, and so that kind of etching first. That's my first, you know, inspiration. Uh, I'm not trying to create exactly what I saw, but I am trying to create the feeling of what I saw. And in fact, I usually when I'm traveling, I have a notepad uh, in between myself and the passenger seat uh, with a little talk there with the and I and uh, when I see something I'll see quickly sketch and I will write down um I might write down uh pickle juice you know as as the as the as the land and what I would use to create the sky you know um because those are you know if I just write if I write P-I-C-K, I know when I go back to look at those notes what that inspiration was you know what the sky was gonna be and so it's really something that I've, it's something I've experienced. Um, um, typically something I've, you know, where I've been there and experienced, or sometimes, you know, people just send me, you know, I have tons of friends who send me, you know, sunsets, you know, especially <laughs> from, you know, from the East Bay over to Mount Tam, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's all, uh, and so I just, I put those in my inspiration folder and, you know, we'll reflect on those sometimes. I'm curious, I mentioned it earlier, but I'm, I'm curious about the group Red Umbrellas. And if you wanted to talk a little bit about what that is. So Red Umbrellas is a group that is uh, dedicated to activating public space with art, where, the, where you have public art, only the art gets to interact with uh, the artist and the art. And so you get this great exchange of people being able to take in some artwork and also actually talk to a, a living artist, you know, who created it. And kind of gets insight. Sorry, and we and we do that by uh, you know, by you know populating uh, space that is typically not used. Mm-hmm. We have a group of about a dozen artists, and um, it's a juried art group. Uh, we're only allowed to show original art, and artists are allowed to you know, are able to have discussions with people you know who, who are engaging in the artwork, and um, I. I, I had a phenomenal weekend. Uh, I can't believe that I, you know, that I can make a living doing this. I'm really glad that you do. And uh, I think we're really lucky to have your art with us. Well, I, I'm, I, like I said, I, I was excited when you reached out and, um, um, and I'm always, uh, you know, always a fan of, you know, just exposing artwork and having discussions about it.